the return of prohibition. An especially clear example of the kind of abuse the existence of the criminal law makes possible is the war on drugs. If they remember it at all, most Americans recall prohibition as a kind of joke, with alcohol widely available on a wink wink, nudge nudge basis. Certainly, respectable Americans didn't take it very seriously. Even Earl Warren, very much a straight arrow, As Attorney General, he led efforts to shut down gambling off the coast of California, for instance. Returned home from his work as Alameda County's Prohibition era district attorney to enjoy a glass of whiskey. But it nonetheless provided the opportunity for the state to spend an enormous amount of money and threaten and imprison nonviolent people. It also spurred the violence of organized thugs and boosted the national murder rate. It's not surprising that most Americans were glad to see prohibition go. The cost of the drug war. But the same mentality is very much in evidence today, as politicians spend unbelievable sums attacking the consumption of other substances of which some of their constituents disapprove and packing vast numbers of people off to prison, frequently for lengthy periods. The U.S. government spent $15 billion on the war on drugs in 2010. At the time I wrote this paragraph, in January 2011, national, state, and local agencies in the United States had already spent almost $6 billion on the failed drug war in the new year, and over 120,000 people had already been arrested for drug offenses. Of those people, 64,519 were arrested for violating laws related to marijuana, the vast majority simply for possessing cannabis products. In the United States, someone is arrested for violating drug laws about every 19 seconds. In 2005, over a fifth of the people in state prisons and more than half of those in federal prisons were incarcerated for drug offenses. More than 25% of black and Latino prison inmates are doing time for drug related activities. The arbitrariness of the drug war. There's certainly room for disagreement about the extent to which various substances are harmful. It is clear, however, that the prohibition of harmful substances is anything but uniform and consistent. Consuming high fat products seems to kill many Americans, but there is little pressure for a violent war on fatty foods, leading to the imprisonment of the people who buy and sell milkshakes and french fries. It is equally clear that whatever remedies might be appropriate for any of the harms associated with the sale and consumption of currently illegal drugs, prison terms, which destroy people's lives and blot their records, Are abusively unjust responses to nonviolent behavior. The drug war as a creature of the state. It is also clear that nothing of this kind would occur absent the state. Without the state, there would, in the vast majority of cases, be no one interested in suing for damages as a result of a voluntary drug transaction. The state, by contrast, Need not be concerned about showing damages in order to use its illegitimate power to arrest and imprison people. And it can fund its expanding drug war by extracting the needed funds from unwilling taxpayers. The possession and sale of drugs wouldn't be criminalized without the action of the state, nor, of course, would anything else. There would also likely be far fewer acts of violence associated with drug transactions were such transactions not criminalized. Because their disputes concern illegal transactions, people lack access to the legal system to resolve these disputes. And the fact that their transactions are already illegal is likely to make them more willing to resort to violence. One might as well be hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. In addition, the illegal character of drug transactions means that these transactions are conducted largely in secret. Because they are, those who participate in them are more likely to engage in fraud, theft, and violence than they would be if drug sales took place in the open, 
since public scrutiny tends to reduce aggressive behavior, even apart from the fear of legal sanction. Further, because the state makes drug sales illegal, drug transactions are much more costly than they would be otherwise. One result of the high cost of the drug trade is that there are fewer drug sellers than there would be without the state's involvement. Sellers can thus charge very high prices and earn far more for the products they sell than they would if more sellers were involved. Because large amounts of money are therefore involved in many drug transactions, sellers may be more inclined to use violence to protect their possessions or to steal from others than they would be if potential gains were lower. Finally, the costly nature of drug prices makes it harder for those who want to purchase drugs to do so and therefore makes it more likely that they will see no way of purchasing these drugs apart from fraud or robbery. There's at least one more disturbing way in which the drug war is a creature of the state. Even while attacking the private sale and consumption of substances like cocaine and heroin, the state encourages the drug business. For instance, as journalist Gary Webb showed in exhaustive detail, the U.S. government's Central Intelligence Agency facilitated the shipment of drugs to Los Angeles and their subsequent sale in order to make it easier for the Nicaraguan Contras to obtain funding, since direct U.S. government funding had been prohibited by Congress. Similarly, some observers have maintained that the CIA assisted Afghan drug lords and facilitated the transportation of opium from Afghanistan on their behalf in exchange for their aid in fighting the Russian occupation of their country. Comparable claims have been made regarding CIA support for drug lords, purportedly valued allies, in Afghanistan today. The continued use of state power against sellers and consumers of drugs is especially troubling, given the state actors may well be deliberately involved in propping up the drug business. Innocent Victims the human costs imposed by the drug war on people buying and selling drugs are enormous. Even people not involved in the drug business can easily become victims. The authorities provide incentives for people to finger others as drug suppliers. Even when evidence is limited or apparently non-existent, someone may be convicted and sentenced to prison on the basis of an informant's testimony. Civil forfeiture laws allow government agencies to seize and sell possession supposedly used for or acquired with the proceeds of a criminal conspiracy. What's worse, they can do so without criminal convictions or even criminal charges. When someone's possessions are seized under forfeiture statute, the law places the burden on her to persuade the state to give them back by showing that they were not used in the commission of a crime. Thus, a law enforcement agency has a powerful incentive to allege that someone has sold or conspired to sell drugs. If it does, forfeiture legislation can authorize the agency to take her possessions for its own use or for sale. In addition, the disregard for personal freedom and dignity reflected in the operation of the drug war itself, the sense that law enforcement officers can do whatever they need to do in the course of performing their state-assigned tasks, and the culture of violence that obtains in many police agencies all make it unsurprising that people who aren't even involved in buying or selling drugs get hurt as the state tries to enforce its drug laws. For instance, the members of a SWAT team apparently didn't realize that the house they were assaulting wasn't the one mentioned in the warrant that purportedly authorized their actions. That didn't stop them from shooting and killing 64-year-old John Adams as he sat in front of his television. The U.S. government provided inaccurate information to Peru's Air Force that led to the downing of a plane carrying missionaries and to the death of a 35-year-old Baptist missionary and her seven-month-old daughter. A 43-year-old man with no weapons in his hand begged for his life as he was shot by men who began chasing him and from whom he, 
understandably, fled. While he may have thought these men in street clothes were ordinary thugs, they were, you guessed it, drug cops trying to serve a warrant on someone else. A man turned up at a house to pay a $20 debt. He never left because he was shot in the head by an officer during a SWAT team raid on the house that happened to take place while he was there. An 84-year-old woman was accidentally shot in her bed by police officers during a drug raid. Even when the casualties are less terrible, the war on drugs is destructive. It ruins people's lives. It threatens everyone's freedom. In this sense, Everyone is among its victims. It wouldn't happen without the state, and its continued awfulness is another reason for us to move toward life without the state as quickly as possible.